and welcome to CO 738 Probabilistic Methods. Today we'll be discussing Bregman's Theorem. So today's lecture is another probabilistic lens where we focus in on one particular theorem, though it will be a bit longer than the previous. So what is Bregman's Theorem about? Bregman's Theorem is about permanence, the cousin of determinants. The permanent of a matrix A, denoted per of A, is the sum of sigma and Sn, so Sn is the set of permutations on n elements, so it's the sum over permutation sigma of the product of i equal 1 to n of a i sigma i. That should be reminiscent of determinants, except that there are no negative 1 powers, so there's no signs. Everything is positive here. Thus, if the entries a were non-negative, the permanent would also be non-negative. So what is a natural question about determinants? It's the following. If A is an n by n 0, 1 matrix, so let's forget about the entries, they're either 0 or 1, how large can the permanent be, since it would be non-negative then? And you might want to pause and think of the answer of this question. What is the answer? It's n factorial. You take all 1s. So if you have the choice, you would just make everything 1, therefore the product would be 1. For each permutation, you'd get n factorial, as there are n factorial permutations. So this is a bit of a trivial question, uh, that it doesn't have a, a very nice, it's, it's a natural question to ask, but it, it's quite easy, you just maximize as much as possible. So maybe let's ask a better question then. Let's put some kind of restriction on what we want to ask, not allowing just all ones. So here's a natural way to do that. It's row sums. You let ri be the sum of j equal 1 n of a i j. So you sum up the entries in the row, the i row, you denote that by ri. Now, given this, it's natural to ask if A is an n by n 0, 1 matrix, how large can the permanent be in terms of the RI? So again, focusing on 0, 1, but now with some restriction. So it's not even clear that there should be a natural answer or question uh, in terms of these RI, but there is, in fact, a very nice bound, and that will be today's topic. So what is Bregman's theorem? It was conjectured by Mink in 1963 that there's a certain inequality that holds, and it was proved by Bregman in 1973. It says that if A is an n by n 0, 1 matrix, then the permanent of A is at most the product i equal 1 to n of ri factorial to the 1 over ri, where the ri's are again those row sums. So when ri is n for every n, then you get you just recover the n factorial that we had before, but this shows a range then, uh, a very tight collection of the ri. So we'll discuss uh, in some applications of this at the end and, and why it's natural and somehow how it's also tight, um, but we're going to move on uh, with a proof. So that's the main focus of today, using probabilistic methods to prove Bregman's theorem. So how will we do this? The proof that we'll do is follows that from Milan and Spencer, and it's similar to that of Scriver from 1978. So not Bregman's original proof necessarily, uh, but a nice proof nonetheless. So what is the proof idea? Well, it's a bit complicated, so I'll break it down into steps. We'll set up a random lazy calculation of the permanent. So the idea is that we will do not something of the permanent, but some other calculation that's similar, but not quite the same as the permanent. And we'll do this uh, calculation a bit randomly. So you can kind of think of it as a random algorithm that's ca for calculating the permanent. What we'll show is that this actually overestimates the permanent, the upper bounds uh, per of A. And then uh, when we have that, we actually have to go about calculating this, this value, this random lazy calculation, and that's where we're going to use randomness, and particularly we'll use the linearity of expectation, but in a way we haven't seen before. We're going to use it on logarithms of products, and that will be equivalent to so-called geometric means. So if you haven't seen this before, it's quite nice uh, that we can actually use linearity of expectation on these logarithms, thus allowing products. So we'll end up that product on the, the right-hand side of Bregman's theorem will be what we'll end up calculating uh, as the geometric mean of our random lazy calculation. So let's proceed with discussing some of these things. First, I wanted to talk about geometric means. So if y is greater than zero, that's a variable, takes values a1 to as with probabilities p1 to ps, so you think of this as a random variable, then the geometric mean of y, unlike the expectation or normal arithmetic mean, is defined to be e to the expectation of the log of y. And if you work out what that means, it's equal to the product of i equal 1 to s of ai to the pi. So instead of taking 
uh, this kind of average, the sum average, we take a, a product average where the probabilities go into the exponents. So that is the definition of a geometric mean. And then the nice fact we get is that if y is the product of y1 up to yn, other random variables, not necessarily independent, then g of y is the product of the geometric means, of the gyi's. So why is this? It follows from linearity expectation as ln of y is equal to the sum of the ln of yi's, right? If we're a product, then our logarithms are sums. And then you could apply linearity expectation to these logarithmic variables, namely that g of y, which is e to the expectation of log y, is then e equal to e to the sum of the expectation of the log yi, that's by linearity of expectation, which then reverses to become the product of the gyi's. So that's the nice idea that geometric means act on products as arithmetic means act on sums. All right, so that's our brief tutorial on geometric means. We'll proceed now with our proof. To do this, we'll need our lazy calculation. What is our lazy calculation? We'll let S be the set of permutations sigma in Sn, such that Ai sigma i is equal to one for every i in n. So namely, this is the set of permutations that actually gets counted towards the permanent. So the permanent would just be the size of this set. So why are we denoting it by name? Well, it's going to factor into our randomness. We're gonna let sigma in S and tau in Sn be chosen independently and uniformly. So we're gonna to need to make two choices. One choice is we're gonna choose among all these uh, permutations that count toward the permanent at random. And then a second choice, that's sigma, then tau will just be any permutation. So tau we're gonna to use to do to help with the random algorithm in essence to calculate the permanent it'll just give us a random ordering of the n's the one up to n all right given that i can start to define that's our randomness what this calculation looks like so let's begin let r tau of i viewed as a function of sigma and tau as inputs will be equal to the sum j is at least i of a tau i sigma of tau j so what would this be? Well, if tau is just the identity for the moment, this would be the sum of the i of sigma j. So you're somehow summing up uh, the numbers when uh, the entries there were given the sigma permutation where it's at least later. So we're, we know, I'll point out that a i sigma i is always equal to one. So this will be a one at least. But what it's really doing is you can view it as the following, that what you want to do is you want to calculate a row sum that would normally be just all the ones, but here we're gonna, we're gonna say it's, it has to be at least, j is at least i. So we kind of only want to calculate the partial row sums when say like from i onwards, except what we're also gonna do is we're gonna add in this tau. So we're gonna do that, that's the point of the tau is a bit at randomly. A different way to think of this is what we do is we fix a sigma and then we're going to delete uh, the entry ai sigma i in that. We're going to delete the row i and we're going to delete column sigma i and pass to a sub-permanent uh, of a sub-matrix, a permanent of a sub-matrix, and then repeat this. So we'll delete a column, row and column one at a time, always guaranteed to be calculating permits because we're using sigma, except we're going to do this we're not just in the order of sigma, we're not going to delete first row and sigma one column, second row and sigma two column, we're going to delete in a random order from the sigma. So that's the idea. If you fix sigma, let's then calculate these kind of partial row sums we get in doing this permanent as we delete columns and rows in a random order. So now that you understand that, then here's our lazy calculation. Based on a sigma and a tau is the product of these row sums of sigma and tau. So the row of tau i, that's the row we're gonna delete at step i. We take its number of ones and we product them together. So this gives a somewhat lazy calculation of the permanent. It's somewhat calculating the product of the, the rows, but only partially. We don't wanna overestimate too much, but it tends to be a good calculation in an upper bound because it will tend to, because we're using sigma, which is a, a honest to goodness permutation that gives rise to a product of one, it prioritizes those, so it prioritizes subpermanents with higher value. All right, so just take that definition as you want. Again, you can refer to Alan and Spencer. Uh, for all the details, this is a somewhat abbreviated version, 
uh, where we've calculated now this L. Now we're going to consider the geometric mean G of L, which will be the product, of course, of sigma and S tau and Sn of L sigma tau to the 1 over the number of S, which is permanent of A, and the number of Sn, which is n factorial. Right, so each of these outcomes is equally likely, so we can have the same probability of 1 over permanent A n factorial. So that's our random lazy calculation. The randomness from the choice of sigma and tau, that's how to delete the rows and columns coming from the sigma, uh, the sigma being which one, which backbone to guarantee, the tau being the order in which to do it. All right, so now if we take that, what do we want to go from there? We claim that the permanent of A is at most G of L, is at most this geometric mean of our lazy calculation. So we'll give us an upper bound. So we're going to prove this claim over the next uh, few slides, and then we'll return, calculate G of L, and show it is indeed that value on the right-hand side. So let's start with the claim. How do we prove the claim? So why should this be an upper bound? Well, let's fix tau. So the, the ordering doesn't, at this point, doesn't really matter. It's just some ordering of how we would process the rows and columns. So let's just fix tau. And without loss of generality, we'll indeed say that, uh, we'll assume that tau of 1 is equal to 1. So we're going to go row by row. Let's just assume for simplicity that we, the thing we're going to delete is actually the first row. We're going to go by induction on n, the size of the matrix, of course. Then we're going to let r denote r1, that's the number of 1s in row 1. So this is the thing we're interested in, the number we're going to be used in our calculation of the lazy uh, permanent. So given that, now we can proceed. Without loss of generality, let's also assume that a1j is 1, if and only if j is in r, 1 up to r. What does that mean? We're just going to assume all of the 1s are in the first r columns of the matrix. Again, just without loss of generality to simplify the calculations, as it's the same up to symmetry. All right, so now that we've done that, we're going to let aij denote the matrix obtained from a by deleting row i and column j. So if you're used to determinant or similarly permanent calculations, it's natural to write these as the sum when you delete row i and column j, uh, say you summed over you know, a row. So let's let AI denote that, AIJ denote that. Then we're going to let TJ denote the permanent of A1J. And we're going to define T to be the sum of the T1 up to TR over R, so the average of these Ts. Why do we do that? It will mean that RT is the sum of the Ts, which will be the permanent of A. Right? So the permanent of A is precisely the sum of these subpermanents, as these are precisely the ones we need because they're the only ones that have an entry of 1. All right, given all of that setup, now the claim is that by induction, the rest of the lazy calculation, r2 up to rn, is conditioning on sigma 1 being j, is going to be at least tj, right? So if we continued by induction with this n minus 1 by n minus 1 submatrix, its lazy calculation, which would be the same here, as if we just did the rest of our calculation, has to be at least that permanent, which is tj by definition. All right, then we can continue on. So how do we finish the proof of the claim? Well, since tj is the number of permutations sigma, where sigma 1 is equal to j, which start with that 1j entry, we find that g of l, this geometric mean, is precisely the product of i equal 1 to r of r times the rest of the uh, lazy calculation for that condition by times by the prob to the power of the probability of that. What's the probability? Here it's over, again, tau is fixed, so we don't care about that. It's just the number of sigma which have j, which start with sigma 1 being j, which is precisely a probability of tj over the permanent of a. So tj of the fraction of the, the total permanent option of permutations will go with this j calculation. Then we knew from induction that that lazy calculation is at least tj, so we can just slot that in there. So this will be at least the product of rtj to the tj over permanent of a, which is equal, if you rewrite it, to r. We can just bring out an r, so the r will get raised to tj over permanent a, producted, so that will just be an r out front, of the tj to the tj over rt, that's the permanent of a. 
So now we're almost done. We just need to figure out what this, this product is. It's the product of the tj's to the tj power, of j equal one to r, to the one over r. Uh, so let's look at that, except not with the one over t. So I've kind of, we're gonna have the teeth root of that value up top. Let's just look at this value. I claim that that value is at least t to the t. Why should that make sense? Well, you can kind of view this as, as a geometric mean in a way itself. And in particular, this is equivalent to, if we take logs, of 1 over r, the sum of tj log tj. That's what tj to the tj would be. And I claim that's at least t log t. Why is that? You might stop and pause and think for a bit, but the answer is the convexity of x, l, and x. So these t's are all non-negative, of course, and x, l, and x is actually a convex function. Uh, so therefore, you know, t is the average of the tj's. So indeed, if we take their average of those functions, it's at least the value evaluated the average. All right, so that's our um, number there. And then hence, g of l is uh, at least r uh, times this product, which we know that product will then be t to the t, but the t through to that, which will be t. So we'll get rt, which will be the permanent of a. And that concludes the proof there. So the basic idea, again, is that the tj's tell us the probability weights to calculate that geometric mean, and somehow then, instead of using them in particular, instead we could just, because of the biconvexity, we can use their average. And then their average, you know, will end up to the teeth power, but it'll take a teeth root, and we'll just end up with the permanent of A. So somehow the permanent of A is more what actually happens on average here, where this geometric mean uh, is actually more just these products, where the individual TJs. So that's the proof of our claim. Now we can move forward with finishing the proof. We have to calculate what G of L is, what the conditional, what this um, geometric mean is. To do that, we're going to condition, and this time on sigma. So before we somehow fix tau, we didn't care about that. Here, we'll actually fix sigma. So we'll fix the particular backbone permutation we're using to do this calculation. And we'll let tau be free. And the claim is then, then this g of ri conditioned on sigma, so for any particular rho i, so actual rho i, that it's going to be uh, the product of ri to the 1 over ri times ri minus 1 to the 1 over ri all the way down to 1 to the 1 over ri, which will of course equal ri factorial to the 1 over ri. Why is this true? Well, it's because the number of 1s remaining in rho i, when rho i is deleted, is uniform in 1 to ri, right? So ri is this number of 1s. That's the most we can product by. We always get to at least product by 1, and the most we get to product by is ri. And it's one of the inner values in between. And you just think about it, what happens? We could do it out more probabilistically, but just uh, naturally, the idea is that the number of 1s we have remaining when we actually do the calculation is uniform, because at this tau will end up just deleting uh, some of the columns, and so what's going to naturally happen is uh, we have no control over that, so it's equally likely that we'll have deleted uh, down to where there's only, you know, some number between 1 and ri left, and they're all equally likely uh, that we end up picking the row to calculate uh, is at equally likely at any stage. So you can think through that, but that's what we get. And now we use the linearity expectation of these geometric means. So g, uh, the geometric mean of L for a fixed sigma, so conditioned on sigma, is of course then uh, g of the product of the ri's conditioned on that sigma, which would be the by um, the linearity of expectation for geometric means will be the product of the geometric means of ri, again conditioned on sigma, which from above is ri factorial to the one over ri. And you'll notice, therefore, that that number does not depend on sigma in any way, shape, or form. So that's quite nice. It means that it's the same value for each sigma, so g of l will be the mean of those. It's always the same number, so it'll just be the product of ri factorial of the 1 over ri. And hence, by our claim, the permanent is the most this geometric mean, which is ri to the factorial of 1 over ri. So that concludes the proof of Bregman's theorem. So again, what's the idea there is that for this random calculation, 
as we're randomly deleting rows and columns, that a row is equally likely uh, geometric mean wise to have ri or ri minus one or ri minus two all the way down to one row, ones left when we do the calculation. So that's where this ri factorial uh, to the one over ri comes from. As one over r of the time, it will be each of those different values. And then the key from before from the claim was to show the permanent is upper bounded uh, by this geometric mean calculation. So that concludes our proof of Bregman's theorem. As for applications, I should just mention there's a nice corollary conjectured by Ragzer in 1960, before Mink, uh, that if you had an n by n matrix, 0, 1 matrix, whose row and column sums are equal to k, so if the ris were all k, then of course the permanent of a will be at most k factorial to the n over k. So this is a, a weakening, a special case of the conjecture where all the row and column sums are equal. But it shows you the power that seems non-trivial to actually prove and indeed it's actually tight when k divides n for the matrix with n over k, k by k blocks of all ones. So you have a k by k block, a k by k block, etc. diagonalized down and you can calculate that that is indeed going to give you k factorial inside each block permutations uh, and then n over k choices among them. So that's nice. Another nice corollary is that if g is a equal to AB is a bipartite graph with same sizes, so A equal to B, then the number of perfect matchings of G is at most the product over the vertices in A of the degree of those vertices factorial to the one over their degree. So this also, another way to think about it, there's a relation between these permanents and perfect matchings. So this gives a nice bound, upper bound on the number of perfect matchings in bipartite graphs in terms of their degrees, which can be uh, quite useful. So that's two very nice applications of Bregman's theorem. Later in the course, we may see more. Uh, it's a very nice theorem in its own regard as permanents are fundamental, but hopefully it also showed off some more uses of probability. So this time we actually set up a probabilistic process that was not of the thing itself, the variable itself, but an upper bound to it. So we showed that it's, it's an upper bound, and then we use linearity of expectation to calculate that upper bound variable. So that's maybe something we haven't exactly seen before, but also we use geometric means. So we use linearity expectation on the products of these, on products for these logarithms, which is also very nice as we had not seen that before. So until next time, see you then.